Good morning, I'm Lion Brave, and today we have a special guest with us who has an incredible t story to tell about how he was taken into a hostage situation in Venezuela. Uh, Jose, can you please introduce us to who you are and begin sharing your story? Okay, good morning, thank you for having me, uh, and thank you for that. Me. My name is Jose Pereira. I am a former uh, executive of oil and gas for more than 35 years. I was a CEO of a multinational company. And um, at some point in, the, in November 2017, we were called for a last minute meeting in Caracas, Caracas, Venezuela, where is located the headquarters of this company. And uh, when we arrived there, unfortunately, we were put in the middle of a settlement and we, we were uh, uh, got caught and they put us a lot of bizarre charts and, and we went to jail in Venezuela. So this was something that suddenly happened to us. So uh, that's part of my story. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that's uh, so you uh, have said that you you felt like uh, you were a political pawn in this situation. Can you go into more detail about uh, what you mean by that? What kind of politics were at play? Why they would kidnap you guys in the first place? Okay, because again, we were regular guys. You know, I, I was a guy that did, did a long career in in, in in the oil and gas in in 2017. If you go back to that that date, they were having some issues between the U.S. and, and Venezuela. The, the administration that was in, in place at the moment was putting a lot of sanctions uh, against Venezuela. And we were aware, aware about the situation, but to tell you the truth, we never saw that it, that could affect us because we were regular guys, we were not politicians. So when we got there and they cut us, our first impression that that was a mistake, but at some point, couldn't believe we, it. They said, but we why understood why that we were get caught because they wanted to have some political pawns and some bargain chips to exchange for uh, uh, find some benefits or relief. And we were caught in the middle of that. It became like a perfect storm for us. Well, uh, I would like to know more details. You say there's there were six of you. So how how were six of you uh, captured in the first place? Were you captured by gunpoint? Were you guys in a company van that was jacked? Can you uh, tell us more details about? Well, the I, I okay. Thank you, thank you. I, in November 2017, uh, as I said, I received a phone call to have to go to this uh, last minute meeting, and 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 they picked pointed who should go attend the meeting. After that, we understood that they wanted to have their dual Venezuelan-American citizens. So so we went that I, that was a CEO, plus five of our uh, top executives. So it was a business trip going to Caracas. And when we had it there, we were in the middle of a meeting. It was a big, big meeting with more than 500 people in, in the in the headquarters of, 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 the, of the company. And suddenly came some guys with dressing like Robocops and, and, and with uh, this name that said Dijesim. Um, to tell you the truth, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of what Dijesim was. And then we found that that was the counterintelligent police of that country. And, and literally we were caught and they put us handcuffed and we went to jail directly. We went directly to jail. Okay, um, so do you think you six were targeted specifically, or do you think it could have been any six of you who worked at that company? Today we were targeted because, again, I as I always said that in that plane, if a, a little dog, a puppy could come, it would get targeted because that wasn't us. What was the objective to have? The, those pawns and 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 again uh, we were targeted because we were there anybody who had f come in that plane will get targeted okay so so for my understanding is like so um the, when they came 
and abducted you, they used the local police force to do it. So even if they were armed, they were not necessarily pointing guns. It was more like commanding to come with us due to false charges. Yes, basically that. Basically that because they 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 they, they send that to this uh, police that is called the Hesin. We stayed there. It was something terrible because uh, we were isolated. We didn't have no communication. I, I, we really didn't know what was going on. We realized what was going on because like two or three days after, we, we went sent to the court, courthouse to put the charge. And there was this a handyman working, painting there. And this guy had a newspaper. And for as a miracle, the guy said, hey, you want to read something? And he gave me the newspaper. So I saw in the breaking news, our case, it, when I saw it, I said, this is a mistake. This is not happening to us. Because, of course, all the things they were saying was false. Because the point here is that they, they target, they put any false charge, they, you go to a sham trial because the objective is targeted. They want to have you there because they want to use it. This is part of what we're going to be talking about the hostage diplomacy. Uh, well, Jose, thank you for being brave enough to share your story with us. Uh, I would like to dive in for a little more details. Now, especially because your name has already been clear and uh, your colleagues' names have already been clear. Um, I believe that's why you guys are all back home. Uh, and we know that these accusations were false. Would you be willing to share with us what were some of the allegations they were putting on you guys? Oh, they, they put us uh, um, espionage. Uh, treason, uh, corruption, embezzlement, um, a lot of charges. What's was ridiculous. There was charges like treason. So they were treating us like we were spies. Because, again, this company was in the middle of this political thing that was happening between Venezuela and the U.S. Unfortunately, and we were there. We were in the perfect storm, in the in the wrong place, in the wrong moment. Okay, and then just from a, a, a bigger picture, uh, like what would you say the relationship is like, especially back in that time with Venezuela? Would you, would, would you say we're allies? Would you say we're polarized? Like what kind of relationship are no, we? No, it was a bad relation, but it was a bad relation. But, but you know, I, I, I want to go more further of, of, of the situation because uh, um, my intention, my, my new uh, uh, project in life is, is not to stop there because this was a very uh, severe situation over there. But at the end, we found that this is something that we discovered that is what is the call hosted diplomacy. That is what I want to talk now about. Well, you have the floor, Jose. Don't let me stop you. Okay, so, you know, um, the situation for us was really bad. We had like 10 months that we didn't have no communication. We were put in, in a room that was like a closet that had no, no windows, no, no running water, no nothing. So at the, at the beginning, we thought, as I said, that was a mistake. But when we realized that we really was going through that, we went to a surviving mode. So when we went to the surviving mode, we didn't know nothing about our family. We stayed like 10 months without no communication. The first time I had communication is that I, I knew how hard our family was fighting for us. And, and the situation began to evolve. The situation began to evolve. And, and at some point, these guys allowed us to bring some books. And for some reason that today I still don't understand, there, there came to me a book like a miracle. It's a book of a guy that was in a concentration camp in World War II. His name is Victor Frank. And the book is The Man in Search of a Meaning. I strongly recommend everybody always to read that book. Well, when I wrote the book, that guy was like talking to me because uh, he was telling that you, you need to have faith in God and have a meaning, have a purpose in your life. So I found that my purpose was as coming back strong to my family, say so strong in body, spirit, and soul. And, and, and we that became like an anthem for us. So that was something that 
we found there. So at the beginning, we were lost with little communication, but we, when we found that book, we, we found our path. And that gave us a lot of hope, a lot of strength, and the situation was like a game changing for us. Oh, well, I'm glad that you guys were able to find uh, coping strategies uh, through uh, an, another man's book, because also this situation has inspired you to write a book. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, we we are a very structured guy. And by the way, all of us, because we were not friends. Some of the guys that came from, with me, well, the first time I saw it was when they came with me with the plane. So. We were not friends. We were colleagues, but not, we're not friends. So when we, we met there and, and we had the opportunity to be together, we found that we had a, a lot of commonality. All of us were very structured guys with more than 30 years of career with a very, very strategic mind thinking. So we began to figure out how to manage the situation. So we designed a plan, a plan, a structured plan, how to survive. and, and we did several things. The first thing was try to stay calm and focused in the situation. And I strongly recommend everybody that in any adversity do it that way. I'm a guy that always had been a very positive mind. So, so I was thinking that the, uh, we will survive that. And we found the connection with the family in the way that is, is kind of amazing because uh, we didn't have no communication. At some point, they begin to give us like a one one minute call, and and we were even uh, uh, starving to death. They came a commission of the UN to see us, and when they saw us that we were starving, they recommended that they, we needed food supplement because the, 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 in the jail was poor the the food. So they begin to allow us to bring food food from the from from the outside. So my, my family managed to be, be put somebody to bring me food, and every time I was uh, taking back the you know the the, the cans or the, the container of the food, I managed to smuggle some letters to my wife, and and we begin to do it in a way that we do it like almost during three years. So so when I came back, I had almost one thousand letters already written. It became like a diary. So that, that at the end, with the help of my wife, I converted in what is gonna be my book. My book is already done. It's an editing process, and it's gonna be published very soon. It's in that process. But the important of the book is that it's based on my experience. It's based on what I was feeling in that moment. I have been having conversation with my editor, and she's kind of in shock, saying that how I vividly described the situation because it was my diary. That's how the way I was feeling at that moment. Well, I am glad that you were able to uh, find resilience and strength in this situation. Okay, so not only are you writing a book, but you're also uh, you're coming up with a coaching program to help uh, teach us that we can overcome any hardship and obstacle. Uh, could you give us some of your tips? Okay, yeah. This is, thank you for making the question because when we came back because continue with that the way we survived having the the family when we found that the, the family was fighting hard for us and at some point they created a campaign with uh, other families and i'm going to talk later about that that is called the bring our family home campaign for us that was a, a gave us a boost in our hope so we were really really committed that we we were going to be come back and we found solace in god because at some point we had the bible we begin, begin to read the bible we begin to pray every night so in, in our plan we included the praying and the and, and the reading of the bible plus another things like uh, making exercising in that closet. So we did a lot of things. So, you know, we managed to do it one day at a time. So we did it on a daily basis. We did it on a weekly basis. We did it on a monthly basis. We did it on a yearly basis. And after five years, after 1,775 days, we came back. How it happened is gonna be part of, well, we're not talk extensively now about the hostage diplomacy, for, but when I came back and answered your question, we found that the situation has a 
strong pattern. It's happening to a lot of families. And, and being part of this Bring Your Family campaign, I met a lot of hostess family, a lot of ex former hostesses, and we found that this is happening to a lot of people. And we begin to uh, give them message of hope, and 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 it begin to work giving this message to 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 those people. So. Because as I explained to you, I'm a structured guy and I begin to talk with uh, my therapist, uh, with a guy specialist in trauma, and I been, begin to do a lot of research. And I decided to put a program to help others under any adversity. I have done, I have put in a name that is called Life Pills for a Survivor Guide. The program is uh, LPSG. So what that, what that program means to do, that program means to help others under any adversity in life to survive. When I say any, is any. I'm saying that you're going to have a problem in your marriage. I'm saying that you're having struggle in your finance life. I'm saying that you're having an illness. I'm saying that you're having some problem with your kids, addiction, whatever. Any situation you can survive. Because I learned that when you have any adversity, you, you have two choices. You can get caught in the adversity, or you can try to uh, transcend and succeed. That's what we did, and that's why we're trying to teach others. By the way, I'm I have in my LinkedIn account I a newsletter. I invite people to go to my LinkedIn account and, and read my newsletter. I do free subscription every week. I'm talking about this. I have been talking extensively about this theme about how to survive, how to overcome situation, how to succeed and how to be successful. And this is going to become kind of my mission, my new mission, because I was a guy that in the past, my, if you talk with me five years ago, six years ago, I was in the middle of the get retired because I had 35 years working. So my intention was to become an advisor in the oil and gas. Now I changed my life. This changed my life. I want to do this. I want to do help people. So uh, that, that was a life changer. That was, ah, that, that put me in this situation. Well, I think it's uh, very interesting that, you know, being in an environment like that, you probably didn't have too much literature to read, but you, you know, you did have uh, Victor Frank's books, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, and it, it sounds like that experience gave you meaning. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, there, there's lots of questions I have. Like one, I find it interesting that you were talking about trying to exercise in that little closet. And then ultimately there's a a handful, six, six, six men in that, that little space. And then, so one thing is your muscle would atrophy your, you would become weaker and weaker in that environment. Um, so, you know, I find it interesting that you guys did realize it, it was best to try to maintain as much muscle as possible. But also when you're talking about God now, do you think the meaning and the hope had to stem from God? Or do you think really what was uh, causing you to continue to move forward was just, you know, uh, hope itself? No, I'm a, I'm a truly believer that was the hand of God. I I, I respect any, any other essence that people believe, like you can believe in the universe. One of the guys that was with me is from the Buddhism. So he believes in the universe. You can believe in your higher power. I'm a Christian guy, so I truly believe in God. And I begin to see signs of God, because one of the things that I understood is that God always ha has been with me. I did a very successful career. I always thought that it was casualty, that I was I was a lucky guy. No, I, that was not a lucky. That was God helping me. And at, at the same time, he put me this proof because he wanted me to do what I'm now I'm doing. So it was God. So we did things, for example, eating. Eating for us became, became a, a ritual because we had three bunk beds of two stories, the six guys in a 100 square meter closet. So when we were going to eat, it was one by one only in, in, in a chair with yourself eating like you were in your house. So I, I ate, then I went to my bed, and then came another guy, and then we did it that way. Then we did it at the same cleaning. We were cleaning that, that closet every day to, 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 to feel safe. 
we begin to do exercises. I, I was doing yoga, the other guy was doing uh, push up, the other guy was doing with, with uh, uh, meditation, the other guy was doing uh, static uh, walking, a lot of static walking there. And we will keep uh, uh, on that. And then we begin to read. I, I not only, because at that point we had a, a lot to get books. And I can tell you, I, I wrote there more than 300 books. So it came for me, in, 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 in other situations, I would have never read so much book as I read there. So that, that, that now became part of my, my, my uh, experience that I had there. And as I said, we were praying. I read the Bible like three times there. And, and we were doing like uh, Bible studies and we were praying a lot. So and the, the answer, the long answer is it was God. Everything was done because of God. And now when I came back, we went to a program of post-isolation in a military base here in San Antonio, Texas. And the first time I arrived to my house, the first thing I did was go to church. So I became a church guy. I am a truly believer in the hand of God. Okay, well, that's uh, cool. Uh, I know a lot of people have been strengthened by God um, in their journeys. Um, I also know that uh, talking about your your coaching methods for resilience and survival, and especially because you contribute to your connection with uh, the divine realm to be so important to your uh, resilience. There has always been a correlation between connecting with God and fasting, and even Jesus fast in the, the Bible himself, and the devil is trying to tempt him to eat. So would you uh, maybe recommend that and to some people that fasting is an essential part to building their resilience? Of course, of course. It, part, part of, uh, of what I, I learned here is that God is always beside you, always. He will never let you down. He will ne never put you put any proof that you cannot succeed. So sometimes you feel that you are lost. Sometimes people say, hey, what is happening to me? Sometimes you say, I, 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 I can manage it. But you will do it. You will do it. And of course, the, the family support is something that's so important. So important. I can tell you, and, and anybody can, can, can say that, when you're going through any adverse situation, who is going to be beside you? It's going to be your, your loved ones. You do see your significant one, your family. Even you can be uh, your family, everybody is separated, but at the end, everybody comes together and, and be together. In my case, I survived because my family. My family did a lot. I'm saying my wife and my three kids, they literally put their life in pause for me. So I came back because of their support. If, they, if I hadn't had the support of my wife and my three kids, this will never happen. Um, well, I'm really glad that your family was not only concerned about you, but they were proactive about getting you help. Um, but with that being said, for so, you know, sometimes people don't know how to help in more complicated matters. You know, you, you weren't even in your home country. So, could you, for families who are in this situation, since you're, it's a, it's a, it's a, a problem many people from around the world my experience, uh, would you, can you tell us some of the, the, the steps your family took to help, to help you that other families might be able to take? Okay. This is very important. Your question. Thank you. Because now I want to introduce the topic of the hostage diplomacy. People are not aware what the hostage diplomacy is. Let, let me try to educate people here a little bit. By the way, if you go to my newsletter, LinkedIn, this week, I'm going to begin to talk extensively in, in this topic. Okay. Because I, I'm not an expert, okay? I'm a humble guy that has been learned through his experience about what it is. So the hostage diplomacy is something that, that is not new, has been done through centuries. But these countries that are applying this normally are tyrannies, that they, they are like uh, doing copy-paste in, in, in the, their tactics. So what they do, you are a normal guy, from a country that they want something from the country. For example, you are a U.S. guy 
or you are a UK guy, or you are an Australian guy, or a Belgian guy, and that country has an issue with that country. So they see your passport, and you're in a family vacation. You can be in a swimming pool. You can be taking photos of a, in a museum. You can be in a conference. You can be in a business trip, like my case. You can be visiting a family. You can be unawarely in the wrong place, and then when they see that you have the passport, you get caught. They put you false charge, they make you a sham trial, and they, be, they begin to negotiate for you because that what happened to us. So that is what is the so-called hostage diplomacy. And this is something that, to tell you the truth, has to be stopped because it's growing and growing and growing. So the, in the, typically in the U.S., the people are not aware about the situation. And there is a foundation called the Foley Foundation, that, that this uh, Austin Job with Austin uh, Affairs, and they have documented more than 60 Americans that right now are caught in a lot of countries. I'm talking about Iran, I'm talking Russia, I'm talking about China, I'm talking about uh, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Syria, Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea, a lot of countries are, are doing the same practice because they have been refining the method. So when I learned about this, and because being part of the Bring Our Family Home campaign, as I told you, I have been in contact with many, many families that they have, they have been or are still being with hostage situations. So what did our family do? At the beginning, they were also lost. They were lost. They will, they didn't know as nothing how to handle this because nobody's prepared for this situation. Nobody. And 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 when they begin to have the conversation with with the government, the first recommendation was to stay quiet. Do not talk to the press. We're gonna do something behind the scenes. That is a strong mistake, because when when the family learned that they were all the family were alone, lost. At some point, one marvelous ladies that, that are part of the, our campaign, the, there is a lady that I want to recognize, there, there is a daughter of one of the guy was with me, Alexandra, and a lady that unfortunately his uh, brother is kept in Iran, she's name is Neda. These two ladies plus uh, two very well-known uh, communication strategies, uh, they, they, they are very awesome, Amber and John, uh, Jonathan. They, these two guys, with the help with these two ladies, they put together this Bring Our Family Home campaign. It was a, a family initiative. That made, was a game changer because now the, all the families were together going in the same direction, rowing the boat in the same direction. So every time somebody went to the press, was talking about everybody. So these began to make pressure and pressure and pressure. And then came the case of Brittany Griner. That, that, that she was a fa famous and she she was part of the, or she is still part of the family. And by the way, Brittany became the campaign, the, the champion of the, the campaign. She became like the face of the campaign and we truly recognize her and give her thanks to her for doing that because it gave a boot. So now the families has that, that, that campaign that supports everybody. So for my family in the beginning, that was, amazing the job they had to do alone but at, at the end they found all this campaign helping them uh, sorry can hear you thank you for sharing that uh, i would like to share something quickly too which is you know everyone does not have family um so uh, if you can and it's not always possible uh, try to reach out to your embassy. Now, if you're a United States citizen, you are lucky that you have an embassy and there are definitely people you should be calling. Um, and and uh, uh, But unfortunately, there are some uh, corp countries who do not have embassies. And then, so if you don't have an embassy or a family, uh, I guess your next best bet would be to try to reach out to the United Nations or, or, or even local grassroots lawyers or even churches, even churches, um, but also, uh, you know, I'm starting a company called Accent Ambassadors to try and fill this gap because like an another thing is like you, you, some people could be stranded in a country where not only are people not speaking English, but then that's not their local language either. And that, that can create, oh, 
extreme complications. Like I know people, are, you know, that they're not necessarily criminals and they're not necessarily interesting at all, but uh, they, they just disappear like ghosts, like, in, in, you know, lost in transit and not in a cute movie type way. Okay. Let me tell you, in our case, in our case happened in 2017, six months after we were there, that we realized we were political pawns, the ambassador of the U.S. was expelled. So today, Venezuela doesn't have a, a U.S. embassy. So, so we lost. We, we were lost. We were no communication. What happened? That that now that because all this pressure that the family has been doing in 2019 was created a law. It is called the Levinson Hostage Recovery Act. This name is because there was a unfortunate guy called Robert Levinson that he he was lost in Syria. He never appeared. He never appeared. He was declared dead because his body never appeared. So in, in, in the honor of him, this law has his name. The Roberts or Levinson Act, what does is give the tools to the government to, to go against these countries to help the hostages. And they classify you as a wrongfully detained. That was what happened to us. When we were classified to, as wrongfully detained, so you, you go to the umbrella of the State Department, they have an office called the Special Presidential Office for Hostile Affairs that they can take care of you. But besides that, there are some reputed, reputed foundations like the Richardson Center, the Foley Foundation, the Hosted US Foundation, Hosted Aid Worldwide. So there are several foundations they are working to advocate and to support the family. Maybe because the people don't know about this, is they, they don't go to them. But these foundations are working a lot uh, uh, to bring back Americans home. Well, we definitely are uh, happy that you're on here sharing this kind of information because one thing life has taught me is when you get thrown a curveball, it comes out of nowhere. You weren't expecting it. You weren't thinking about it. You weren't preparing for it. You weren't planning for it. So, you know, uh, you know, thank you for sharing this information with us. I think that um, your coaching and your, your books are going to be helpful. Um, I am going to tell you that we're about to run out of time, so we need to make our, our final statements. Okay. Um, so, um, go, go. What, what do you got to say? Okay. Well, I want to say to the people first, I, I'm going to continue advocating for the hostess community because this is part of my family. Now I always say that this is a family that you don't never want to be, but at the end you, you become part of it. But for the general public, my country probably wants to talk about how you can survive under adversity. We're going to be also speaking about this. We're going to be talking in this in my book, not only about my experience of, of what I went through, because I want to give my experience that transcendence to help others, to inspire others. And and also we're talking with a producer, maybe to, to do a video, a docu series about this. But all is directed to help others under any adversity. You can always survive any adversity in the life. You can do it. We are proof of that. So uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, follow me. I have now my link tree where I have all my social medias, but typically I'm writing in the newsletter in my link tree about this. Every week I'm talking about this. If you go to my my, my uh, link, uh, LinkedIn, you will see like six episode that have been talking and, and, and posting videos talking about this because I found that this is my new mission in life and well I think this is the way I can help others and my final statement is never lose faith never lose hope and never give up that's it thank you uh, well I have a message a final message for you uh, your middle name is angel is that correct or yes angel yes uh -huh. okay so what a a great middle name uh I so you know one thing we say here in America is uh uh God you you don't have to be uh, qualified or have experience God will qualify you you know something like he he qualifies the cold so like I know you're saying you're humble and you're not the expert but you officially moving forward, you are the expert, especially because we need people to be experts in this field, especially because 
Um, I don't know how life experience has always been the best teacher. Um, and, and obviously you seem to be driven and passionate about this cause and uh, nothing makes someone a better leader than having lived through it themselves. Uh, so, you know, I'm glad you have uh, found a way to serve the community in an even greater way uh, than uh, before. And I, I certainly think you're going to go on to do a lot of good in the world. I think uh, I've I've felt a little inspired by you. I thank you for coming on and sharing your story with the audience. And uh, I, I would love to chat with you again, Jose. Uh, we do need to wrap up. So I'm going to have to say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the audience. Following me in LinkedIn to know more about these topics. The